let us say, prejudiced against Muslim or Middle Eastern uh, workers. They were warned that American businesses are to accommodate the religious needs of Muslims and assure that they aren't being harassed or intimidated, states the order, which was issued by the business-killing EEOC, the bloated federal agency, which acts as a sort of Gestapo for the Justice Department against businesses. And those businesses who do not oblige will be prosecuted by the Obama administration for violating federal law, specifically Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of religion. Now, I'm all for no discrimination against people, but this is not about discrimination. This is about discrimination against businesses for making a profit. Here are some other headlines on the Savage Nation. The U.N. may seek sanctions against North Korea over the nuclear tests. They took their time out from insider deals uh, at the U.N. to say that they strongly condemn North Korea's new nuclear tests. Well, that, that will surely rein in the man with the long trench coat. Here's another one for those of you who don't know what's going on. According to Colonel Stephen Warren, ISIS fighters are trying to blend in with the civilian population as they are fleeing Syria. They're shaving their beards and trying to hide among the civilian population as the rats run out of Raqqa. Now that the rats are finally facing men with guns and they are no longer able to rape eight-year-old Yazidi girls, the rats are shaving their holy beards and trying to make believe that they're just civilians. Maybe Obama could bring a million of them in as poor refugees just looking to start a new life in a new land. Crazy times, huh? Hydrogen bombs, ISIS fighters shaving their beards, trying to blend in with the population. And Obama's biggest problem is the Second Amendment. It just shows you what happens when your optic chiasma is broken. Check it out. Look it up. I'll be back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. It's a day of breaking news. This is urgent. You know about the uh, militia occupying a federal building in Oregon, right? Well, the Oath Keepers have issued an urgent warning for the militia that is occupying the federal building in Oregon to keep women and children away, claiming to have received a tip that military special ops assets have been assigned to the standoff by the Obama administration. Instead of assigning special ops to the thugs who burned down Ferguson or to the thugs who burned down Baltimore, Obama is assigning them to the uh, situation in Oregon. Well, what would you expect? But the bigger issue to me is this issue of the Korean nuke, whether it's hydrogen or atomic or anything else. The trick is to understand why are they doing it now. Why would they set a bomb off now as the issue, whether it's hydrogen or not, is not the issue. The issue is, what is what, what's in it for the North Koreans to even conduct a test? And you'd have to look to China for that answer. And you'll see that the Chinese stock market has been plummeting. And they've had to re-juggle their currency. This is to threaten America. In case we're thinking about fighting back with sanctions or tariffs. They're threatening us through their junkyard dog of North Korea. All right, Pat on KSFO, you're calling about the Korean bomb. What's your point? with the North Koreans is the, what exactly they're doing. I strongly suspect that they're working on a miniaturization process. Uh, right now, a 10 kiloton device with modern technology can be miniaturized down to 6 inches in diameter, 15 inches long, 10 kiloton device. 
So I think that's what's going on. Uh, you know, that's just, that's the size of a big thermos, six inches by fifteen. So if they start producing these things, six inches by fifteen inch devices, what are they going to do with them? And then secondly, think about the industrial base that it takes to do that. Now there's a pattern established of continual testing in North Korea. It costs about twenty million dollars to build up one of these bombs, and probably that much more to test the darn thing. Where are they getting the industrial base to build these things and test them? And there's a constant, continual pattern of building and testing in North Korea. It's a, it's a huge concern. Well, okay, you're a very knowledgeable man. You know far more about it than I do. But you asked the question for which you do have an answer. It's China, isn't it? I strongly suspect that. That industrial base is coming from somewhere, and China is right next door. I think you're spot on with the junkyard dog analogy. Okay, so now let me ask you as a brilliant caller, do you agree with me that China is behind this nuclear test and for the reasons I stated? I strongly suspect that, and then I think you have to look over the hill and what they're going to do with these things. Once they have these 6-inch by 15-inch diameter 10 kiloton, 10 kiloton devices built up, what are they going to do with them? Are they going to hand them off to Iran? Are they going to hand them off to terrorists? Uh, you know, there's a huge concern, there's a huge question on what's going on over there. And, you know, my concern is North Korea has already established a pattern. They have the industrial base, and they have a pattern of building and testing, building and testing. So there is a plan, and more than likely China's behind it. I agree with you. Well, why doesn't China rein them in? Why don't people go to China? They have the, the latent leverage to get the North Koreans to stop. And uh, up until now, China hasn't been willing to do that. Why not? Yeah. Why won't China intervene? It's because they're probably behind it. That's the only conclusion I can draw. I agree. Now, are you, are you in the nuclear business? I've done a lot of research on it. I, I work in the electronics business. So uh, it's been uh, kind of like a sideline research uh, thing for me. I've listened to Bill Wattenberg over the years, and Bill Wattenberg has expressed the same thing. That, uh, yeah, Bill, Bill is a great guy. Bill is a great guy, very brilliant man on, on the local KGO, I think. But what is a miniaturized hydrogen bomb? What exactly is it that it can fit in a thermos? How do they make it so small? It's, uh, it's the industrial base that's well established, unfortunately, by the United States and through spies and, and uh, industrial espionage. That technology was stolen from the United States. From there, it went to Russia, and the Chinese ultimately ended up with it. And uh, unfortunately, the sad situation is it's our own technology that's looking back at us. So, you know... It, it, well, by the, well, what I remember is that an atomic bomb is based on fission, that is the breaking of an atom's nucleus into smaller particles. That releases neutrons and lots of energy that becomes an atomic explosion. But in comparison, a hydrogen bomb is about fusion, not fission. And in fusion, you fuse atomic nuclei together to combine into bigger ones. And as we all know, even from grade school, I learned this in the sixth grade, a, an H-bomb or a thermonuclear bomb contains a fission weapon inside, meaning an atomic bomb as a trigger, but it has a two-stage reaction process. It's very complicated. How in the world can they put it into a thermos? Yeah, it, well, it, it's just that that's the, the quest that's been going on for years on end, to make these things smaller and, and uh, to get them into missiles. And they can also dial the, uh, yeah. the, the yield. They can dial the yield anywhere from uh, 170 to 200 kilotons. I'm looking at some information on the, the Internet right now. It's called the... Well, let's put this in context. A kiloton is equal to what? What What was the size of the bomb on Hiroshima, dropped on Hiroshima? That was between a, 10, a 12 and a 15 kiloton device. So, All right, so the, the explosion in Korea yesterday was 6 kilotons. And so you're saying the one in Japan, dropped on Japan by the U.S., was bigger than that? Uh, it, it, yeah, it was about twice that size. And then there was a... Well, one. I want people to understand how big these bombs get. In 1954, mind you, the U.S. conducted tests of the hydrogen bomb in the Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands, and it produced an explosion to be up to 1,000 times more powerful than that of the atomic bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. And it was known as a Bravo bomb, and it yielded 15 megatons, or 15 million tons of TNT, and it was the largest bomb ever exploded by the United States. But that's not the largest bomb ever exploded. 
The largest ever H-bomb, known as the Tsar Bomba, was detonated by the then Soviet Union in 1961 with a yield of 50 megatons. Now, 50 megatons can take out the entire East Coast. And that was the scaled-down version of, of a 100-megaton bomb that they actually envisioned. Well, you see, they were being uh, liberal about it. They didn't want to take out the whole nation, only half of it. They just, they wanted to, dem you know, they, they never weaponized that thing. That thing was huge. I've seen pictures of it. It's, it, it. But, again, my concern is the miniaturization process that's taken place over the last 40, 50 years. Uh, it, it's extremely scary. These things, you know, you can get two or three of them now in uh, a good-sized bag, uh, six inches by 15 inches. Sure, they could ship it over in a, in a shipment of kimchi next time into Oakland here in San Francisco, San Francisco Bay. Look, this is a, a crazy day in American history. And what's even crazier is that we have a president who, instead of taking on the big issues, focuses only on the very narrow agenda of the radical left. That's really the issue here. And I think that the maniacs like those who run North Korea see weakness and a sort of, I want to call it myopia, I would call it madness on the part of Obama, where they know they can get away with this without any ramifications. What would you do today if you were Barack Obama in light of this test, whether it be hydrogen or atomic? What would you be saying? Wouldn't you say something? You know, uh, uh, I can't put myself in, in his position because I think the man is extremely and incredibly naive. He's not the wizard of smart. And uh, he's been given credit for that by the, uh, the willing accomplices and the liberal media time and time again. Uh, I think we have somebody that's in the, the Oval Office right now that's uh, that's uh, uh, unfortunately extremely ignorant of world affairs. Uh, look what's going on in the Middle East with uh, with the Arab Spring. That was a huge disaster, and that's one of the reasons why the Russians are in Syria right now. Well, you know your stuff, and I'm very proud to have you as a listener on KSFO, my home station, really, here in San Francisco. I mean, I consider all my stations my home station in a way, but I did start here in this city, and I have a huge fan base here. I want to send you a copy of Government Zero for one reason only. It's as pertinent today, if not more so, than it was uh, last fall. Stay on the line, and we'll send you that copy. What is China really doing here? That's what I want the, lead the, the listeners to think about. Why do you think... China, because I still think it's China pulling the strings on this a nuclear test, I have to assume that, because North Korea is a client state of China. Why would China want North Korea to set off the jitters around the world? Remember, it's not just us. France, Britain, Russia, even China today said, oh boy, this is bad. Why would they send jitters around the world today, given the precarious state of the world, given the precarious financial state of the world, why would China want to do this today is the primary question that we should be discussing, I believe. Joe in New York City on WABC, what's your idea on this? Uh, Michael, I'd like to throw something else into your suspicion. Um, I read a piece a few weeks ago that possibly ta uh, Taiwan might be taken over by China. China wants Taiwan as uh, Putin took over Crimea, uh, and that would uh, create a lot of mess. Uh, they're in the South China Sea already, building up those islands. Uh, the, the Taiwanese have uh, requested uh, military aid from uh, the Obama administration. They haven't given it. So of course not. That one? Obama would capitulate in one second if China tr invaded uh, Taiwan. They have backed none of our allies. In fact, they've sta he stabbed our allies in the back. Look what he's done to Israel. He has backed Iran, the arch enemy of Israel. So why wouldn't he back China, the arch enemy of Taiwan? You know, to China, Taiwan is just a renegade piece of land. You know that. Right. Exactly. That's where the Chinese... The, I, don't know, I don't know if people even understand what Taiwan is. And when Taiwan became the industrial uh, giant that it actually is, long before China reemerged, Taiwan did because it was based upon... Free market, you know that. But Chiang Kai Shek had to escape uh, from Mao Zedong in the revolution there in the 40s. You know exactly right. So to them, Chiang Kai Shek was just a revolutionary who stole land from the motherland of China. They consider it a renegade province that they're going to retake. And I don't think Obama would stop them, frankly, and they probably know it. So perhaps this is a prelude, in other words, as a shot across the bow, so to speak of an invasion of Taiwan, isn't that what you're implying? 
Absolutely, and this could be an emergency uh, for Obama also to maybe extend. I think his tears, uh, his crocodile tears that you talked about, might be tears that he, he, he fears that he has to leave this powerful office. And, and any kind of uh, world uh, a traumatic experience that could happen could keep him in. Uh, I saw the tears not, not as tears. He was taking such pleasure in sticking it to the American middle class again. The man got his rocks off in plain English doing what he did yesterday. There was no 